we'll, we'll, we'll start with kind of a little overview. We've been doing a discussion this quarter on Christian evidences based off of this book, um, Investigating Christian Evidences by Bert Thompson and Brad Harrell. And they do a lot of good work. Um, they're good folks. And our, our main verse we've been talking about um, is it requires faith to believe this, but it also requires faith for the folks that believe in evolution. It actually requires more faith. <laughs> Hebrews 11, 1 through 3. Hebrews 11, 1 through 3 tells us, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. So faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Nobody saw the beginning of the earth. Nobody saw evolution. You have to have faith to believe either in creation or evolution. It requires faith because no one has seen either of those things happen. The other reason we're kind of studying this, instead of more of a traditional, um, like we did Joshua before, you know, you just got books of the Bible, um, is that we need to be ready to give an answer. And 1 Peter 3.15 tells us, But in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. So we need to be ready to give an answer for the hope that's in us, and that kind of ties back to the to the last verse we talked about, you know, the hope that we have of God and all he's done for us. And then we're also told to um, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. So we're supposed to be ready to give an answer. And we have been working through in this quarter um, the case for the existence of God. How did the universe get here? Um, we talked about the universe's great designer for a week or two. And then we talked about the probability of amino acids being created at random out of just the elements that are out there. How can an amino acid happen? And of course it requires, it's extremely improbable, um, you're not going to win the lottery, well, I'm against gambling, but we're not, we're not going to wear all that out again, but the chance is, is like 1 in 10 to the um, 6,000 zeros, it's like no chance. But that's just to create an amino acid, and of course, you've got to have a string of those to create DNA. We talked about the human body in detail, the human body's great designer, and the evil, pain, and suffering. And then we talked about um, laws of science. We got into thermodynamics a bit, and, and that, I'm an engineer by training, so that was okay. Scientific foreknowledge in the Bible. Can a Christian believe in both creation and evolution, and then dinosaurs, and then now we're into what are um, a section of the book on answers to evolutionary arguments. So that's where we are. In the handout, we're on page 28. So we're going to examine the fossil record today. And the, the fossil record is important because this is the facts. This is the evidence that is there. We don't get to see the beginning of the universe. It's not going to happen over. Um, here we are, but we have fossils. And so this is, this is the, what, what there is to look at that provides the evidence of what happened. So if you think about the evolutionary model, what the evolutionists would say, they're going to look at the fossil record and they're going to, going to expect four things. The oldest rocks are going to have evidence of the most primitive forms of life because that's the oldest life, so the oldest rocks, most primitive, that, and that's life that could turn into a fossil because you could have had primitive life, a single cell thing that can't be fossilized, you wouldn't find it. But it wouldn't have taken that long to move up 
that evolutionary chain to, to have things that have some sort of hard exoskeleton or something like that. You would expect in that model to see the younger rocks have more complicated forms of life. And then you would just expect to find in the record a gradual change from simple to complex. You'd, you'd have that and you'd have these transitional forms, what we might call missing links. So you would expect, if this is what happened, then you're going to expect to see old primitive life forms and the oldest rocks, younger rocks with more complex, a transition simple to complex, and then this transitional forms in between. So, and this was, this plan was laid out even from um, Charles Darwin in his book, The Origin of Species. Um, he, he explained that this would be what you would expect, but he also went on to note, geology assuredly does not reveal any such finely graduated or organic chain. And this perhaps is the most obvious and serious objection we can be um, that can be argued about the theory of evolution. The explanation lies, and this is Darwin's, in I believe in the extreme imperfection of the geo geologic, geologic record. So he, this, he explained that yeah, um, it should be there, but it's not, but it's because the, the fossil record <coughs> is, is failed, for, you know, it's failed, it's not perfect, it's old. You know, it's deteriorated. You know, okay, I get that. So you have um, folks looking for that. And we would acknowledge that the fossil record's imperfect. It's just not going to be a perfect thing. You know, you don't have layers of earth and all the stone are out there perfectly level and got date numbers on them. That's, you know, <laughs> we, we, we wish. But the other model, which would be the creation model, is going to predict you find different things in the fossils. Okay, because when we think about creation, um, we're going to think, okay, the oldest rocks don't have to have the most primitive organisms. Okay, the younger rocks don't necessarily could, but don't have to have the more complicated forms of life. Um, we wouldn't expect a simple to complex progression to be always there. Um, we would expect, the main difference is, um, you're not hard on those first rules, but then you come to, you would expect a sudden explosion of diverse forms of life and simple and complex all just happened at one time. And then you also would not expect to find transitional forms since there wasn't a transition. If it was created, it all happened at one time. So that's what you're going to expect if that's what the record shows. Um, we did talk about a little bit about when we talk about complexity. It's not necessarily we think of humans at the top of the, of the food chain, but when you talk about the DNA and the complexity of DNA, um, we saw last week that humans have 46 genes, and, or 46 um, as their their chromosome number, chimpanzees have 48, and I was in Home Depot yesterday and I saw these ferns there and they were looking down on me because those <laughs> ferns have like 400 chromosome number. And I could tell they were thinking, look this clown, he doesn't even know enough to buy me and take me home. <laughs> but that's how that goes sometimes. So we look at the fossil record and we want to see what the facts are, okay? Um, both evolutionists and creationists agree on one thing. If there's gonna be any evidence, we're gonna find it in the fossil record. Lagrasse Clark um, commented that, evo that evolution actually did occur, can only be scientifically established by the discovery of the fossilized remains of representative samples of these intermittent types which have been postulated on the basis of the indirect evidence. In other words, the really critical evidence for evolution must be provided by the paleontologist whose business is to study the fossil record. So, okay, we're, we're going to look for that. And it's going to be obvious whether it supports or not. So, first we think about the 
the progression that should be simple to complex <coughs> in the different, you know, age of rocks. And there is not any, um, when you look at the strata of the rocks, basically it comes along and then there's this Cambrian layer and it's, that's a time period. Um, I think it's like 250 million and it's a long time. As they would claim many, many years ago. And when I was in school, they talked about the Cambrian explosion. And I'm sure some of y'all remember that from, from your, your classes, that basically they look at this record and pre-Cambrian, they don't find little simple cell things or whatever. And, and as mentioned, some things wouldn't, wouldn't fossilize well. But they got to the Cambrian layer, the Cambrian time period, and all of a sudden, bang, here it is. Here's all these fossils. Not only are there fossils, but they're all fully in their complex state. It's like you don't find, you know, half a fish and it doesn't have fins or whatever. No, you find a fish and it's like, well, it has scales and you find birds and they have feathers, not halfway scaled and halfway fed feathers. It's like, okay, these, these animals are all there. <coughs> So this is a problem that there wasn't this long, long, gradual um, move through the different time periods that, that one might expect if, if evolution was true. So they, they worry about, um, they have found a few things that are sort of like jellyfish and worms that look for simpler things, but even those are, are in the scheme of things very complicated. And so they have found a few things that are a little older than that are pre-Cambrian, um, but there is not any bulk of evidence for anything pre-Cambrian. They also, it's, it's, they've noted um, in Science News that it's important because up till now the vertebrates were absence from the Big Bang of Life, as we call it, that is the great early Cambrian explosion where all the major animal groups appeared suddenly in the fossil record. So they find all of these major groups of animals, plants, everything, you know, other than a few exceptions, appeared suddenly, which tends to, if you wanted to look at the list of the two models, well, which one is going to have a sudden expansion of life, and it's going to be creation model, not the evolution model. <coughs> so the, they, because of this Cambrian explosion, that tends to, um, again, things aren't perfect out there in the fossil record, but that's what that's going to support. All of the major animal types or groups evolved in the same period in this jump between pre-Cambrian and Cambrian, and that would be impossible with evolution. It just isn't reasonable. It was um, written by, there's a, a book called When Earth Tipped, Life Went Wild. Before the Cambrian period, almost all life was microscopic, except for some enigmatic soft-bodied organisms. At this start of the Cambrian, about 544 million years ago, again, I'm not saying 544 is accurate, but that's their claim. Um, animals burst forth in a rash of evolutionary activity never since equal. So again, they, the, the folks that study this said, this happened at one time, it's never happened again. It was, you know, it was this explosion of, of animals and plants. The Stefan Bengston of the Institute of Paleontology and the University of Sweden stated, the animal phyla emerged <coughs> out of the Precambrian mist with most of the attributes of their modern descendants. So not only did they all come out at one time, but they came out as we would think of them now. Not, they didn't come out and they were a simpler form. Evolutionist Richard Dawkins, y'all have probably heard of Richard Dawkins, Oxford University wrote, the Cambrian strata of rock vintage about 600 million years ago 
evolutionists are now dating the beginning of the Cambrian at about 530 million years. So that's only 70 million all, but that's <laughs> small. And, and we're talking big, big numbers. And we find many of them already in an advanced state of evolution the very first time they appear. It is as though they were just planted there without any evolutionary history. And again, we see, oh, this was a step change. This was an explosion, not, a, not, not helping to support their theory of this gradual um, evolution. And of course, they have to have the many, many, many years because if you're going to make any of the statistics, any of the math, the probabilities work, for this to evolve and things to have little changes that get better with time, it's going to take millions and millions of years. So that's why they want millions of years. And we're going to get into um, the time, I don't know if we'll get there um, today, but old earth, young earth will be our next major topic. So American scientists on, in an article on the origin of animal body plans, Erwin Douglas wrote, all of the basic architecture of animals were apparently established by the close of the Cambrian explosion. Subsequent evolutionary changes, even those that allowed animals to move out of the sea onto land, involved only modifications of the basic body plans. So since then, before then there wasn't anything in the record, since then, no major evidence of evolution. And he questioned why do so many unusual morphologies appear when they did and not earlier or later. So it all, again, the evidence is showing happened in a, in a tight time period. Um, Stephen J. Gold observed that 500 million sub subsequent years of opportunity have not expanded the Cambrian range achieved in just five million years. The Cambrian explosion was the most remarkable and puzzling event in the history of life. So the scientists are saying, this is amazing. This all happened at one time. <laughs> then they, they state it was abrupt. Um, once again, creationists have built a logical scientific theory on the evidence the sudden appearance of fully formed, complete, functional, well-designed organisms and evolutionists have been forced to invent the, their theory after theory due to a lack of evidence. So that's talking about looking at things moving through and becoming from simple to complex. Okay, the second thing we want to talk about is the fossil record. Does it show um, intermediate forms. Okay, so do you find the missing links? And we talked a little bit about missing links back, um, I know it was when we, we met, it was on Easter, and we, we talked about some of the missing links, and we had a handout on that page 20, and, it, and, and there's a whole um, there's been focus on finding missing links for my whole lifespan and before. This is important. And they know that they got to find these missing links. And we talked about a lot of those where it would be uh, one Nebraska man, it was, they found a single tooth. So they got a tooth. And they were like, yep, this is, this is the missing link. And then they found out later that that tooth was from a pig. <laughs> um, and then Lucy, I'm going to mention Lucy because it's going to come up. It's one of the most famous and completed skeletons. They thought this creature walked upright and our our ancestor, and then they later determined it was basically an egg. And then there was um, another one that may come around in the discussion, Homo habilis, and this supposedly evolved from Lucy, and this creature was an ape. It wasn't human. It was um, an 
an adult female ape that stood about three feet tall and lived two million years after this. So there's um, some of these missing links is, is what they're looking for. So if we think about the, the intermediate forms, um, we're, we're going to look for transitionary body parts. So you're going to look for something that's got half scales and half feathers, or something that's like half a reptile and half a mammal. And they study, folks study for this, and Harvard paleontologist Stephen Gold remarked that the absence of fossil intermediatory stages has been a persistent and nagging problem for the gradualistic accounts of evolution. And he stated the extremely rarity of transitionary forms in the fossil record persists as the trade secret of paleontology. So people hunt for these things and, and they, and they continue, continue to hunt for these transitional forms. And, we're, and we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit and we'll get to human transitions in, in a few minutes. Any comments as, as we go along? My only comment is how stupid can they be? Well. <laughs> I mean, they're taking a man's word. When was Darwin? 18... They didn't even have Harleen's back then. And they're taking man's word that really didn't know much about anything. I mean, he was a smart man, but he still didn't know much about anything scientifically. And they brought it forward as the truth, which is crazy. And there's folks that don't want to admit there's a God. And so what's your, you know, they, they need another option. And I, and I understand that. And this is their best other option. I just don't feel that the evidence, and that's what we're talking about today, does the evidence support their case or does the evidence support the creation case? That's, you know, and if they're scientific minded, then they're going to have to go, well, I either got to go with creation or I got to come up with a better theory than what we've got now. And, and we did talk about that a little bit about the um, theory used to be when we, a lot of us were in school, tree of life. And so you got this tree of life and you've got a linear progression from, you know, simple things through chimpanzees or apes or gorillas up to, you know, your great, great, great grandfather was a monkey. And then now, you, you know, now you're better, right? So that was what they used to have as a plan. And now it's the coral of life is the theory. And the coral of life better matches what they, what they see, which isn't this linear tree. It's um, and the whole tree has to live. The coral life, you have the basic of it and then it expands. And so you have all these different types of life now. But all the old part is dead in coral, only the, the tip of it is alive. And so they move their theories and that's, that's good for them. Um, they need to because, as you just said, what, a lot of what they've been thinking, um, it keeps coming around. That's what's interesting is you know, you, you think they'd go move on, but it keeps coming around. So are we still evolving? If, if that... <laughs> and, and the answer would be yes. And, and you have microevolution. Um, you know, your, your kids, if you have blonde hair and blue eyes, and, and, and your, your wife has blonde hair and blue eyes, then, you know, that your kid can inherit those traits. So it's a slight modification. There can be um, microevolution within a species, and, the, and we, we had spent a time on that. At the, the species is, if you look from moving from the top of the chart of plants and animals, and then you work into animals, and then you work down to mammals, and then you work down to, you know, different, you know, reptiles versus others, and then you get to human beings as a species. Well, you can take a species like 
a bird or a fruit fly or something, and, or a frog, and the frog can evolve. The frog's descendants may have green spots on their legs instead of red and be considered a different species if it can reproduce, but there's never been any any example of something of you know a fish turning into a pig. So you might have you know a, a fish and it comes out a slightly different color or it's its mouth's a little bigger or a little smaller. So there is that within a species level of micro evolution. And that still goes on because you can see um, you can see evidence of that. But you don't ever have um, as the Bible said, they produce after their same kind. Right. And so you don't have any, you know, you don't have kittens come out from a dog. <clears throat> Brian, when I was younger, I did know a, a fella that had what he called a cabot. And they had bred a cat and a rabbit. And that was this animal. But that animal did not reproduce. Yeah. Right. You know, it did not continue to produce cabots. Yeah. Which I find interesting in the discussion we're having. Yeah, they were never going to, you know, wasn't going to progress or evolve into that being the animal. Right, it, a hybrid, and you have that with, with plants too. You can have a hybrid corn, but to be a new species, it has to be able to reproduce. Yeah. And so if you, you know, you breed two things that aren't quite the same, you might get something, but it can't. It's I believe like a mule is a what a horse and a donkey, but the mules can't reproduce themselves. They're sterile. Right. Yeah. yeah. They're they're a hybrid. Yeah. And you can have, you know, corn. Let's say that's a hybrid that's more desirable. It either gives more yield or it's sweeter or whatever. But the seeds from that corn can't be planted and create more. They got to keep. <coughs> so it's not a new species. Well. It makes you wonder at what point, because even, you know, when we read in Bible times and people who worshipped other gods, so to speak, did they believe in the creation account that just worshipped other gods? And at what point did we start, did somebody start to look for another option such as evolution? I mean, because I don't remember anything in the Bible about people talking about us coming through another means of existence what and, and that's a good question that I don't know but you know you think about Charles Darwin and it was and and was it revolutionary because he wrote the book was it revolutionary because you had the printing press and you could print books and people read them but he seems to be the like the father of <coughs> evolutionary theory and it seemed to be 1800s. Okay. If you read a lot of the pagans, though, you can tell where their stories come. I think it's the Greeks, the Romans, the first man. Well, guess what? <coughs> Zeus made him out of dirt. Well, where did he get that? Here yeah. in the Bible. A right. lot of them you can find it's based on creation. They may change it up a little and leave their paganism, but a lot of them it's just based on what's in the scripture. Mm -hmm. yeah. So many things, it, it, to me, it's in, amazing that you see and you're like, you. You don't think about it, but you know, even simple phrases like "there's the handwriting on the wall," and you're like, "Where'd that come from?" From the Bible. And then a few weeks ago, when we talked about um, dinosaurs in the Bible, we talked about Leviathan, and you're like, "Well, where do these stories come of, the, of you know, dragons and stuff?" And well, even like, Hercules being a really strong guy. Well, I wonder where that came from. Right. Yeah, you know. Yeah, there's. Um, it's pretty amazing. Yeah all of the stuff that when you look at it it's like this really came from the Bible. Yeah. Good discussion. Any any other looks well, like almost any story has good versus evil. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. Makes a good story. Yeah. Yeah. People get that somewhere. Right. A good plot. A good plot. So as we we think about these um, intermediate forms it was stated, Oklahoma paleontologist David Kitts, 1974, evolution requires intermediate forms between species, and paleontology does not provide them. You move forward 2001, um, 
Harvard, Ernest Mayer of Harvard, nothing has more impressed the paleontologists than the discontinuous nature of the fossil record. That is the reason so many of them were supporters of, and it talks about leaps or jumps. There's, they, they don't find this continuous transition. And so then we talk a little bit about the missing links. One of those was, um, and I can't produce the name of it, it was half reptile, half bird, and we talked a little about that. Um, this was thought to be the link between reptiles and birds, but it's basically an extinct bird. It's been proven um, that it, it was equivalent to a modern bird. And then they have found crow-type birds that were 75 million years older than yet. So, in, in, as they date them. So it's not like they were trying to say this was the, the transition one. You know, and you've seen pictures of it, it's got sort of looks more like a bat wing with a reptile body. And this was it, this was the missing link, then they found, well, no, we found things that look like crows that are um, 75 million years older, approximately 225 million years old. So it's like, well, that can't be the transition because it's way um, too late for that. Okay, they also talk about horses. Everybody pretty much likes horses. Um, and you've seen pictures, probably when you studied, they had a little bitty horse that was like smaller than a dog, and its, and its name um, is Eohippus, E-O-H-I-P-P-U-S. And it was supposed to be the beginning of horses. Um, and the problem is there's no transitional forms, there's no progression. There's no like, okay, we had that one, and then we had one that was a little bigger, or it had other traits. Um, basically, they now think that it was just a different kind of horse. It was a dead end, so to speak. <clears throat> and that um, we look in the 1950s, scientists had already cast aside that that wasn't true um, evolution with the horses. They knew that in the 50s, um, but that didn't mean they didn't keep putting that in textbooks. And a paleontologist David Roth acknowledged, um, well, we are now about 120 years after Darwin and knowledge of the fossil record has been gradually expanded Ironically, we have even fewer examples of evolutionary transition than we had in, in Darwin's time. By this I mean that some of the classic cases of Darwin change in the fossil record, such as the evolution of the horse in North America, have had to be discarded or modified as a result of more detailed information. What appeared to be a nice, simple progression when relative few data were available now appears to be much more complex and much less gradual. So they don't have the uniform continuous transformation of horses. It never happened in nature. So as you think about this, um, this was one of those things that when you, when you look at the list of what they need to have, that was their their fourth thing they would look for in the, in the record was transition. It looks like, you know, they have so many theories that have been disproved, and then they move on to the next thing. I mean, and they should. they're trying to. That's, that's, that's fine. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, that didn't work out. Um, you don't believe true. this, would you believe that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's one where we're going to get to about, I, like, I, I have fun with this class. This is <laughs> um, and then it's pointed out by George Gaylord Simpson, um, possibility for such dispute exists because transitions between major grades of organ organization are seldom recorded by fossils. This is 
there is in this respect a tendency towards systematic deficiency in the record of the history of life. It is thus is it is it thus possible to claim that such transitions are not recorded because they did not exist? You know, it's like we well, probably aren't finding these because they didn't happen. Uh, and you know, can you? argue, well, it's just absent of the evidence, or can you look at the evidence and go, look, really the evidence is showing um, creation happened, but not. We just aren't finding what we're looking for. We aren't lucky enough to find it. So the creation model predicted a sudden explosion of life, fully formed plants and animals ready to go. Um, the the evidence from the fossil record shows fully formed life appeared suddenly. A mixture of life forms all happened in the Cambrian period. And this seems to be better aligned with the creation model than the, than the evolution model. But it still is not a perfect record. And there, you know, it's like how do you, how do you um, interpret this record? So, so any other comments before we move on to the human beings? <clears throat> well, no, the creation model, the, the things can be proven because they date it back <clears throat> from the Bible. And it was so the kind of animals reproduce after their own that, After their own kind of within that 6,000 year period. Right. So, yeah, the, the old earth, young earth would be a, 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 another topic we'll get to. Um, and people work, you know, work through that. And there's, let's talk about human evolution. And we, we, we spent some time on this back at Easter Sunday. And Obviously, the branch of humans in the tree of life is the most important one because <laughs> we're self-important. <laughs> um, but you know, to science, it's the most important one. They have more people looking for the missing links in the um, human chain than any other part. This is what they just got to find. Um, it's. It's been, um, and, it, and there should be there, because if you think about it, if humans came along, you got this millions of years thing, <coughs> and humans are the most evolved, we like to think we're the best, and we come along at the end, so our fossils have only got to be rotted away for like five million years instead of 500 million years, so there ought to be a lot more of them and they ought to be in a lot better shape because they're, you know, if you go looking for things in the ground, the stuff that's been there outside for the least amount of time has decayed the least. It seems like there would be many of them together instead of just finding one single thing because humans <laughs> aren't together. Yes. You know, in in our existence, we're generally in a family or in a group, group together. And, yeah. and cities and and, yeah. and you you know you find um, you find you should have the least amount of decay, the greatest interest there, the amount of people searching for these, and then they and then there's um, I like because they talk about there are more researchers than there are human fossils that they found, <laughs> you know. And then another one put it, um, Lyle Watson in Science Digest put it, the fossils that decorate our family tree are so scarce that there are still more scientists than specimens. The remarkable fact is that all the physical evidence we have for human evolution can still be placed with room to spare inside a single coffin. Mm -hmm. and, and that was in <clears throat> 1982. And relatively few family tree fossils have been found since the statement was made. So there's, 
lots and lots of people hunting for this stuff and not a whole lot of it. Um, I know we've had the first bell, so I'm not going to get into this, um, that what they claim are all these big names of, of working through um, how man got here. I will, I will know that um, you know, a couple of these we mentioned, Lucy, and so they, they look for these ancestors in our, our set family tree. One of those is Or Orion or Orin, um, and they found 13 fossil fragments, a broken part of a femur, a leg bone, part of a lower jaw, and teeth. And so there's people argue about this, this one because they, they think it um, predates a lot of the others they found by two million years. So this is an older one and they think, they claim that, oh, well you need to forget about some of those other ones because they're not in this family and tree. They're not in this line. And so they, um, they talk about um, chimp-like features and then they study it and they're like, it's a chimpanzee. <laughs> okay, so then in 2001, Nature talked about a well-preserved temporal bone, two partial maxillae, I don't know what a maxillae, M-A-X-I-L-L-A-E is, maybe Hannah knows what a maxillae is. <laughs> They found a few yeah. teeth, uh, okay. and its head was distorted, and it predated others by 3.8 million years, so they think it might have been a previous man. Uh, they talk about National Ge Geographic finding footprints that dated older than Lucy. 3.8 million years old and Lucy's 3.6 million years old. So they found footprints of man, an upright human, that they claim predate Lucy. Um, and of course we talked about Lucy and, and they, for, you know, when I was young that was the one, that was the, the premier missing link that they talked about. Um, they found um, in the bottom of a a bed one, I left the one out, but that there was a, a big, um, and they discovered um, a circular stone cut down in this hole deeper than what they think are the earliest humans, and obviously it required intelligence and someone to build a circular hut, and and that's, that gets us to the second bell, so we will, um, we will talk about the age, old earth, young earth, next time. Thanks for the discussion. Good class.